Yesterday I talked about machine translation and the impact that I think it is having and might have on the future of the translating and interpreting professions. And today I'm going to continue that uh, by updating things I've been saying for too many years. For example, I was here at this university eight years ago and I gave a series of talks which were basically the chapters of that book. Now you'll be very happy, the book is called Exploring Translation Theories, first edition 2010, second edition 2014, and you don't have to buy it because I'll tell you what's in it for free. <laughs> and I'll tell you what's wrong in it for free. In that book, I have the first two chapters are on equivalence. And the other chapters are main translation theories seen as responses to the problem of equivalence. And this week and next, I'll be going through those chapters and updating the book, updating what I said. Always with respect to the impact of machine translation, which I think has affected not just the profession, not just the technology, knowing how to use it, but the way we think about translation itself. Today, I'm going to present to you what I think is the problem of equivalence. I'll talk a little bit about the way that problem can be solved, and I'm going to present one stream which would be a critique of it. Now, this is a, a prestigious academic institution, and, and yesterday, after my talk, I got really good questions. So I thought, you guys are really smart. I have to do something incredibly advanced. So this talk today, I'm sorry, it will not help you be a better translator or interpreter. Sorry. Other days I'll try that, but not today. This, I'm talking about <coughs> basic, heavy-duty translation theory. And I'm going to put it in relation with Western philosophy, because that's the only philosophy I know. You can apply it to Eastern philosophy, that's up to you to do, okay? And I, I want to really talk about the problems of equivalence within serious thought in the Western tradition. It won't be useful, but it might interest you. Let's see, we'll see if it, if it engages with you. I am talking today about equivalence and why it disappeared from exciting translation theory. It didn't go away, it just got buried. Remember we had this yesterday, this diagram, and we had translatorial action. Translators do many things up here as well as translate. And that's exciting. And that's Skopos theory. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. All right? Today, I'm down here at actual translations, and I'm at translations that have the same function. So I'm really talking about this little bit down here. Okay? And this would be the whole of translation theory, what, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, the problem would have been that. How do we get a text with the same function? Equivalence hasn't gone away, it just got buried under all the other stuff, okay? So it's still there, and I'm going back to that sense of equivalence that was operative in those decades. Now, the sense that I'm using is of the kind that is used in machine translation. This is the slide that didn't work yesterday. So I'm recovering, um, covering over my mistakes uh, this is German that you don't understand, except the lady up there. Who's moved? Over here. Are you over here? <laughs> uh, that's old machine translation from Sistra. Horrible, horrible. And this is 
neural machine translation, which is entirely usable in this case. There are just two little things in red that I would uh, uh, notice here. And it's, it's usable and therefore is judged to be successful on criteria of equivalence. But this is from the, the program of a conference I went to in, in Switzerland end of last year. And they had put it through uh, machine translation and it worked entirely well in, in English and in French uh, and in Italian. Now, I talked about the problem there of this word, which is translated incorrectly as a course, if you pass it as an adverbial, that is not equivalent. And these ones, though, are equivalent. That, that, and that all stand as equivalents of that and are equivalent among themselves. What does that mean? What is equivalence then? If, if this is what the way machine translation is working, okay? What is equivalence then? Equivalence simply means that I can't even see what those words are. Oh look. Okay. <coughs> oh, right. That? Oh, right, right. Ah, natural, self-evident, and obvious are all equivalents of this German thing up here, Selbstverständlich. Okay, what does that mean, really? It simply means that in the sentence there, where we have Selbstverständlich, we can put in that word, or that word, or that word, and the discourse will be successful. We're not saying it will be the same. We just say it will be successful. It means that those particular words can replace each other and carry out the same function. And that's the sense of equivalence that was around in those decades. And that's the sense in which I want to use it here. And it is the sense in which it is used and, and is operative in machine translation. Equivalence does not mean, and never will, does not mean usually that there is only one correct translation. Equivalence has, in those years, always accepted that there are many possible translations equally valid, equally functional, let's say. Carrying out an equivalent function can occupy the same place in discourse without making the communication unsuccessful. That, for me, is enough for equivalence to exist. It can be, of course, interlingual or intralingual, since those various translations can replace each other. In classical translation theory, Eugene Nider opposed what he termed dynamic equivalence to formal correspondence, sometimes called formal equivalence. The equivalence I'm talking about here is Nider's dynamic equivalence. It is the counterpart, not the opposite, but the counterpart of formal correspondence. And I think it was a really good idea. It's become incredibly unfashionable, but hey, it was smart in its day. I'll, I'll just tell you a story before we get on to that man. I, I, I gave a conference, I was young, I had hair. <laughs> it was sort of black. Uh, 92, somewhere around there in Prague, big conference, I was really nervous. And, uh, and then Mary Snell Hornby, who was the head of the translation school in Vienna, very active, very, very small, but active. And she, she came out at the end of the conference and, and attacked me. She said, you sound very sure of yourself. She said, what is your definition of translation? Terrible question, huh? If you want to upset anybody, just ask them that. <laughs> what is your definition? <laughs> uh, well, I think translation achieves equivalence. <laughs> she says. It's all finished. That's old. You don't know about functionalism and new functionalism, etc. And I felt like I was... I came to translation studies two decades too late. Okay? Just to spite her, I have a lot of respect for her. Professor Snell Hornby, I'm going back to the old sense of equivalence. Okay. Um, 
Where does that sense of equivalence come from? I don't know. I've been looking around for the oldest reference to equivalence in relations between languages. And the earliest reference I found happens to be this one, which is that guy over there, Edgar Allan Poe, great, uh, great storyteller, terrible rhymer, classic drunk, you can tell, by looking at Poe. Uh, yeah. in, in what is actually a, a poem in prose, uh, from uh, 1848, we've got, um, it's called Eureka, and it begins like this, infinity. This, like God, spirit, and some other expressions of which the equivalents exist in all languages. That's it. The equivalents exist in all languages. I can't find any previous usage. It's not translation theory, but he's talking about something quite important, is by no means the expression of an idea, but of an effort at one. And he's talking about the <coughs> names for the divine, for God, for the beyond. And he's, he says these equivalents exist. But he's not saying that your God is the same as my God, is the same as a Muslim God or a Jewish God or anything. He's just saying, what is the same is the aspiration, the movement towards one, the desire for something beyond. He says, the words are equivalent, not because they're equal in form or even equal in specific concept, they are not, but because in all these languages and societies we find the aspiration to something, function that desire, that longing, that sense of absence, or the sense of desire for explanation, function, basic human function. That's the kind of function that I want to see equivalence operating at. Okay? And it's not a banal. We'll come back to him right at the end. Now, it gets very messy in European. The good thing in, in Chinese translation studies is that Eugene Nida became really popular here and represented the whole of Western translation theory, more or less. So everybody picked up on dynamic equivalence and formal correspondence, and that was a good theory. And then they picked up on Venuti, foreignization, domestication, and that's a good theory. But within Western thought, equivalence was a real mess. Equivalence meant functional equivalence. For me, that's the that's, that's I'm using it. But look, this is in Russian, okay? This is in Russian going right the way from the 1920s through to 1975. And in Russian and in some places in German and in other languages, equivalence, the Russian word for it, meant same word, meant invariance, meant literal, meant uh, formal correspondence, okay? Uh, so the, the, that sense did exist, and did exist for a long time then, prior to neither prior to Catford, uh, prior to the main people we talk about, Vinay Dublin there, for example. So, okay, that's equivalence number one. Forget about it. You've seen it, throw it away. Okay, that is, that is that. the equivalence, that's what people think it is, word for word. But the concept I'm talking about is functional, not word for word. Okay. What's interesting here is that this uh, Russian language discourse on translation maintained different words for invariance at the top and developed a whole lot of things that were substitution. Okay. Substitution. These are what Vinay Dabonet called the procedures. I call them translation solutions. Um, it became richer and richer. The number of things translators could do to change a text in order to achieve equivalent function. When you get to the last guy over there, 1975, the sense of equivalence changes in Soviet translation theory. They give up on that sense of equivalence 
and they adopt the sense that comes from Catford and from UG United, where equivalence is functional and can happen on any level. <coughs> that discourse existed, but they changed in the mid-1970s and adopted what is essentially a, an English language sense of equivalence. So let's get rid of that before you get even more confused than I am. Uh, this is a book cut it off in 1975, and you can see the sense in which he's using the equivalence here to, to, to even to define translation. Okay? What interests me is that here, the transformation into an equivalent text in another language is it's, it's accompanied by transformation. That equivalence is here seen as the result of a transformation. And that's the functional sense that I'm interested in. We change the text to maintain the function. And all those changes can make many, many other things as well. Uh, the important thing is that there does remain an, a certain invariant. Something is the same in both texts, but that invariant could be on any level. It could be uh, on the level of semantics, or referentiality, on expressiveness, it could be phonetics. Uh, okay. any, any language function you like could be invariant. Uh, so this is the moment where that Soviet discourse picks up on the Western discourse of functional equivalence. All right. So what's the problem? There is no problem that makes sense. No problem. 1975. What could be wrong? Here's where the problem came. This is from structuralism. Structuralism is, was the most exciting thing in the mid-20th century, and it came from linguistics, and it generally is seen as coming from uh, Ferdinand de Saussure. Saussure wrote a book, no, he didn't write a book, he gave some lessons, which became the course of general linguistics when he says certain things about the structure of languages. You can see there that you have an animal and you have some meat, right? And in French, that animal is called a mouton, and that bit of meat is called le mouton. Ah. But in English, you know, that animal is a sheep and the meat is mutton or lamb. Okay? So, French term covers two things, English term has one or the other. We know this, languages cut up the world in different ways. If they didn't, we wouldn't have any work to do. So happily, languages cut up the world in different ways. But, look what Saussure does with it. I've modified the text here a bit, and I've modified the example. But he's trying to demonstrate at this point in the cours that uh, it's a signified concepts exist in the language and are not the reference. That the word doesn't refer to something outside of language, the word refers to a concept, a signified, that is in the language system. Okay, a very basic principle of structural linguistics. If words stood for pre existing concepts, that is, if there were true things that everybody thinks the same, they would all have exact equivalence in meaning from one language to the next. But this is not true. And then you've got the example. Okay. So what's the problem? Well, he's saying there are no equivalents between languages. There are no equivalents. That's the foundational text of structural linguistics. He does admit some, some equivalence. He says, the English equivalent of I is ouch. And I haven't done experiments. You have to get a big hammer and a nail and miss with the nail. <laughs> and at one point, I will say I, and at other points, I'll say ouch. <laughs> but usually, I swear a lot <laughs> in French and English. And I haven't. I don't know if they're if they're exactly equivalent, but, but okay. Um, these kinds of things might be equivalent because it's not really semiotic. It's it's a sync. It's a you know, smoke and fire. It's a single. Ah. Uh, 
whereas the properly semiotic system is supposed to have an arbitrary relation between signified and signified, therefore no equivalence. Therefore, for strict structuralism, translation was impossible. Okay? You got this. Is, I'm sorry, this is really simple diagrams. Don't take a photo of this one. <laughs> I'll get shot. Okay. Somebody sends a message to somebody equals somebody sends a message. That's, that's okay. That's going to work within one language, all right? That's equivalent. But if you've got another audience over there with another language, another set of expectations, you've lost your equivalence. Okay? And that's what structuralism is arguing. Translation is basically impossible because languages are different. All right. Okay. Georges Moudin, 1963, moving up through history a bit, picked this up. If the current theses, this is structuralist theses, of lexical, morphological, and syntactic structures are accepted, like Saussure, different languages cut up uh, the world in different ways, one must conclude that translation is impossible. Ah, uh, we've lost our business, folks. We're out. We don't exist. It's impossible what we do. Luckily, Monin was a confirmed Marxist who believed in the truth of praxis. And so he says, but, but, translators exist, they produce, and their products are found useful. Therefore, Either the translators are wrong, or the linguistics is wrong. What do you reckon? Well, historically, the linguistics have found to be wrong. Okay? But for that moment, this was the problem of equivalence. That translation theoretically shouldn't be possible. And even quite intelligent writers say this, talk at length about the the, uh, the, the, the translators must be somewhere near paradise because what they're achieving, you know, is beyond conception. Hey, we do it every day of the week. We do it in our sleep. It's not hard. The linguistics was wrong. But how can we theorize that? How can we prove it? Okay, simple diagram. You can say that there is equivalence here because we've changed the text. You can see I made the text longer in this case. And if I change the text, I can restore equivalence. And I can even do it mathematically, if you like. This is for those of you who remember numbers. 2 plus 3 plus 4 on this side equals 2 plus something plus 3 on the other side. Can you figure it out? What's the answer? Somebody? 4. Yeah, right, okay. So the text is no longer three, it's become four. All right, that's, that's, and that's equivalence. In mathematics, that's all it is. Okay, it's easy with addition because it's commutative, right? So what does it mean? To achieve equivalence, to do this apparently impossible thing, what do we do? Hey, we change the text. I remember first learning about translation, and I sometimes see it in, in beginner students when they start to realize that, that we change texts, and they look at them, but that's cheating. You can't do that. It has to be exactly as long. No. What do you think? We do impossible stuff? No. We change the text. We transform it in order to get functional equivalents. We know, it. I hope, that it's not cheating, but don't tell anybody too much. Eugene Nida had a wonderful demonstration of this very simple concept. It's in one of the books, okay? Uh, ST is your start text or source text, source text. It has to go through the channel, the communication channel, right? And the channel is formed by the number of shared reference between sender and receiver. So the number of things we agree on is a channel, all right? Uh, if it's a normal communication within one language, the channel is fairly wide. But if it's cross-cultural communication, or cross-linguistic, the channel becomes narrower because there are fewer shared reference. If we're going to fit the text through, what do we do? We make it shorter and longer. 
out of Pittsburgh. Okay? Same area. It's a geometric, it, it's like Aristotle. I mean, neither have this moment of glory, I think. But the, the, the area is the same of the two texts. So the content is the same, but one is flatter and longer. That is, there's actually, we know now that we can say there's less lexical variation in a translation, and you'll have expansion uh, through the use of explanation and explicitation, if not other devices. Okay, and that's when equivalence met transformational linguistics, and the problem of translation appeared to be solved. We could just say, look, generally, structuralist linguistics was too strong in its categories, not flexible enough, not, not close enough to the reality of communication and, it, and the exchange between humans. So, that sense of functional linguistics said that all these things that translators do, I showed you this yesterday, all of them are in fact the transformations we make in order to achieve equivalence. All except the last one because at that stage people didn't think translators could add things to the text or take things away. I mean actually add content, not just explicitation, or actually take content away. Uh, these days, I think translators can, uh, others may not. That's up to you. That's a definition of, of translation. That's the thing. So everything's happy. Equivalence won the day. We fought structuralism and made it true. That's why it's a good theory. And it can explain what we do. Now, remember, I was going to talk about machine translation, right? I'm going to get to machine translation. That's just been a bit of history of translation theory. I now want to talk about the background philosophy, what was happening in philosophy while all that was going on. And I'm sorry, this is going to get hard or interesting, as the case may be. That man is Gilles Deleuze, pictured young, and in 1967, he wrote a book, which is one of a number of books as well, uh, which was questioning the search for certitude. There's little doubt, I think, that 20th century philosophy, particularly in Germany, but also in English, took up the problem of finding a grounding for knowledge, finding certainty. We were in an age of indeterminism. Quantum physics had become indeterminist. Most of the natural sciences had become probabilistic. And people like Heidegger, but also Husserl, were saying, how can we be sure of what we know? Uh, so Bertrand Russell and, and, and Alfred Whitehead could write their uh, principles of mathematics and, and produce some 150 pages before pronouncing 1 plus 1 equals 2. I mean, they really have to know, how do we know 1? What is 1? Where, is, where do we see 1? It's, it's a difficult problem. Okay. Now, Deleuze was working in this tradition. Um, like Jacques Derrida, his contemporary, he was working from Rousseau and looking at Kant and, and asking about the very fundamentals of a category. He was dealing with two things, identity and repetition, because he assumed that to know a thing as being worthy of a name, we have to see it more than once. Okay, I have one bottle of water here, and I have one bottle of water there, that repeats that, and thanks to the repetition, I assume they share common properties, identity, and I give them a name. Hello, bottle of water. All right? and we have created a category. Deleuze says, fine, that seems a natural thing to do, but how can I know what repetition itself means? And how can I know of the difference between these two? They're very, very similar, I must say. The difference between the two things, how can I be sure that they are exactly the same? And he sets out to say, I want to have first-hand knowledge of 
Repetition and difference. How can I do that? Where can I find that? And his conclusion is that when we look closely at experience prior to categories, prior to the words that we put on the world, we find an enormous diversity. We find that the categories are never pure. We find that the things that language wants to separate often overlap, blend with each other, produce other things, and are incredibly unstable. And for Deleuze, this is a wonderful thing. This plurality of experience, the wealth of actually coming and confronting the world, discovering things, is worth so much more than the pure categories of science. Whereas for the Germans, it was an upsetting thing. <gasps> We're not sure of what we know. Hey, Deleuze says, enjoy it, folks. We're not sure of what we know. Get into this. Uh, now, that critique became important, and I'll just follow it through, okay? One of the people, ah, okay. I'll give you an, an example of what the critique might be. Heard of Aristotle? Aristotle was a Greek philosopher. And Aristotle will go down to the port at Thessaloniki in Greece, speak with the fishermen, and look at all the fish they were catching. And he'd look at them and categorize them according to how similar or different they are. Okay? And he would categorize not each fish, but the repetition of fish to get a type. All right? And he did it very creatively. Uh, with the fish that were available. And he did it for all animals. He has a book of animals where he talks about it. And here's the way Aristotle divided up animals, okay? Fish are over here with the ones that have red blood, and other ones are over there that they don't have red blood, they have hard or soft bodies, and if they have soft bodies, then down here you get a shellfish, and over there you get a jellyfish. So the things we're calling fish or things in the sea are part of it over here, part of it down there, part of it down there. And it goes on. The categories of thought, of language being imposed on the wealth of experience. Okay? Now, Deleuze would want to look at how wonderful the fish are and how beautiful this particular fish is. Because it's just a bit bigger than that other fish there. And it's even fresher, and it's going to taste nicer. Okay, he would want to know all these other things that have been left out of categorical thought. Other cultures, of course, will divide up the animals in completely different ways. I've just got an example here from uh, uh, was it Unwiku. Uh, it's a language spoken in the north of Australia, an Aboriginal language, and there. They divide up the world not according to fish or plants. There is a fish called a bokum, right? And there is a tree called a bokum. This is crazy. How can you have the same name with a tree and a fish? Aristotle would never do that. All right, because a tree is a tree and a animal. Why do they do that? Why would a language divide up the world so that the tree has the same name as the fish? Well, it so happens that this particular tree, a native white apple tree, it's not an apple tree, it's a small gum tree, at a particular time of the year has fruit, and the fruit falls down into the water. And when the fruit's in the water, this particular fish loves that fruit, <laughs> and it comes along and eats it. So the Aboriginal language is telling everybody, you know what? You know where to catch that fish? You wait for that tree to lose its fruit, and then you come along and you can just pick them out of the water with a spear. So the language is encoding knowledge, not just a categorization of experience, well no, a categorization according to abstract criteria. It's a categorization this time of experience of practical knowledge, how to catch fish. Hey, it's in the language. Much, much better than Aristotle. Much better than Western logic. Okay. Uh, for Deleuze, 
it's not a question of having one or the other. It's a question of, of human experience being able to explore all that and, 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 of having alternative categorizations at the same time. Deleuze worked with a psychoanalyst called Félix Guattari, and together they did several books, one of them on Kafka and the language of Kafka, but they, they challenge the Saussurean notion of what a language is. For Saussure, a language is a system of pure difference, such that if you change one thing in the system, all the others change. It's all connected. And they start saying, what a load of rubbish. A language is always a mixture, a schizophrenic melange. There is no pure language. Everybody has within them a multiplicity of languages. You all speak Mandarin, write Mandarin, but you all speak other kinds of Chinese, I'm sure. And you're mixing that with a bit of English, a lot of English if you're here, and a smattering of other languages. And your linguistic experience is by no means restricted to the structures of one language. We all carry multiple languages within us. And this is the point that they're making in that work, on Kafka, and in the more famous work, A Thousand Plateau, Mean Plateau, does it say how much variety and experience there is in the world that we miss out on when we follow the categories of science. They're talking about the way terms move in and out of an association of language and territory. And they say, how cannot these movements of de-territorialization, abstraction, coming back into experience, re-territorialization, not be relative, perpetually in movement, entangled in each other? They have this tremendously rich, varied view of human experience and are so critical of people who have the opposite categories. Like, for example, sociologists who have a society, linguists who have our language. These were the people who criticized structuralism. And they were making critique that should have been of interest to translation theory. But there was no connection, even though it was happening at the same time. Okay. These guys are very hard to read. They, they, they write in a difficult way. Michel Serre is another of this tradition. I couldn't find a photo of him young. I, I wanted to get them all young. <laughs> uh, now, he uh, follows on like them, and, but his, his thing is the tracing of, of ideas through disciplines, not from one language to another, but from one discipline to another. So he has a book, uh, 1974, called Translation, La Traduction, Translation. I, I remember I bought, in 1979, I went around Europe and bought all the books on translation I could find. I think I got six. And that was one of them. I look at it, what? I can't do anything with this. What's going on? Because he's talking about the way Turner, you know Turner is a, an English painter would paint atmosphere and light, light on fog, and ships that are out. And he says, the painting of Turner is in touch with the development of thermodynamics. And he traces the way ideas about heat and the conversion of energy move from pure science through to painting, and from painting back to pure, pure science. This wonderful, wonderful exploration of going from one mode of thought one discipline, one discourse, if you will, into another. Similarly, for uh, in the same book, we have a chapter on Faulkner, uh, the, the American writer, sometimes associated with the French, uh, uh, and he's looking at the way Faulkner writes and says, you know what, he's thinking in terms of the Bible, and this is a, actually a translation of the Bible. But there is no translation in our sense, it's that thought is being transformed from the biblical epic through the novelistic form. Okay, and other studies like that. So Serre's uh, contribution here is to take translation as a movement of thought between various discourses. 
small systems, if you like. It doesn't stop there. These people, Latour and Caillon, were very uh, much influenced by Deleuze and by Serre. They were a younger generation, and they developed what's called actor network theory. Actor network theory is uh, dedicated to following the way ideas uh, move from science into general practice, with all the resistance that is along the way, and their methodology is not to assume any categories. They would work like ants. Actor network theory is ant, little ants working together. They would do lots of interviews, piece together the way knowledge is passed from one person to another, resistance to knowledge, acceptance of knowledge. They have books, for example, on uh, the way vaccination was introduced into France and the resistance there was to Louis Pasteur and the idea of vaccination, or the way electricity was introduced into France. Uh, how difficult it was to move knowledge from uh, the scientist to the realm of actual uh, social practice. That sense of translation has become very popular. Uh, you'll find uh, many of, if you just look for, uh, do a, a search for, uh, for translation, a lot of what you'll find will be medical translation. How knowledge gets from medical science into actual clinical practice. And, and it's very interesting. And they're using translation in this sense. How knowledge gets transformed as it moves from one party to another. So what is translation for them? This is an early text actually on the social contract. We mean the set of negotiations, intrigues, acts of persuasion, calculations, acts of violence by which an actor or force accords or allows itself to be accorded the authority to speak in the name of another authority. Scientists. It's interesting for me to look at that kind of definition and say, well, that's not the translation I'm doing, because translators <coughs> don't do all that, do they? But especially, translators don't assume the authority to speak on behalf of the author. They do it, but usually the translator assumes, in our cultures, assumes a subordinate role. Here, in the realm of scientific transfer, the translator becomes far more active, uh, far less subordinate, far more apt to undertake transformations in their own way. That, I'll stop there, that, that strand of basically French thought about language did connect with equivalence at the time. But it could have and it should have. What happened instead is that strand has become what is called cultural translation, for many, in anthropology, especially in Hobby Baba, but also in the British tradition of anthropology, where an ethnographer is describing a culture and that's seen as cultural translation. Um, for others, any kind of movement between cultures then becomes called translation or cultural translation if they take the time to add the adjective. In Edwin Gensler's uh, post-translation theory, anything can be seen as a translation. Uh, Gensler says, we should go down to the town square and look at the church and realize what that is a translation of. Look at the post office, what is that a translation of? Look at a university. How is it that this university in China is a translation of the European model of the university, which was a translation of the Islamic uh, religious school at the origin? Uh, all our meanings and, 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 and institutions and, and, and buildings uh, are always translated from some previous experience. That's not the kind of translation we do. But it's out there and it's very interesting. Now, I'm intrigued by the fact that that whole discourse has continued there and we continue regardless. Uh, some, like Ed Gensler or, or Michael Cronin or Emily Apter, 
uh, some of them very much tap into it and say, oh, that's real translation, and the equivalence, that's just an illusion. Uh, from this particular critique, which is an undoing of the structural categories, the greater experience is in the undoing, and what translators do in establishing equivalence is just imposing even more categories, restricting even more experience. And so you have a radical critique of accuracy, for example, or the kind of translation that we're training you to do, or that you're doing, or that you're teaching people to do. We are accused of being naive, of being old-fashioned. Not nice. I'm asking myself, how is it, to go back to Munan, that all that can happen, and yet we continue to do what we do and our clients pay us? Like Munan, we are there, we get paid, we're considered to be useful, and our people read us in terms of equivalence. How is it possible that we do that? Whereas I'm quite prepared to accept that whenever I say this word equals that one, self suggest English equals what was it? Obviously, I know they're different. I know that there's a movement. I know it's repetition. I know there's a difference. I'm aware of it. But equivalence says, ah, it's good enough. Why do we accept equivalence? And I'm going to give some reasons. Quickly, quickly, you've been standing a long time. One, our clients like us to do it because pre-categorical pre experience, that Deleuze thing of the multiplicity, the thousand plateaus, that wealth of, exp of experience is too complex for people to work with. And we get paid to simplify it. Okay? It's an illusion that we are paid to produce. Why? Because we're trusted. Why are we trusted? Because somebody has to reduce complexity. So this is one reason. I, I came to the, at writing the book that I started with. In it, I do describe equivalence as a socially beneficial illusion, necessary for the functioning of society. Trust is part of that illusion mechanism. We're paid to simplify. Is that enough? Is that a good solution? I don't know. I'm thinking of other reasons why equivalence still exists. One is that whenever there is something that looks like an equivalent, like, for example, HTO is HTO, probably in Chinese and in English, why is it equivalent? Hey, because there's a whole institution called chemistry, the study of molecules, which has become international and has the authority of, of, of its science and is found to be useful. And whenever there's that authoritative structure, the kinds of authorities that legislate terminology, then we have equivalence. I know in China, for your foreign affairs discourse, you have published glossaries, which are not just glossaries, of terms, the glossaries of whole sentences. And that is the way you have to translate it. It's equivalent. How do you know it's equivalent? You have an authority that says it's equivalent. That's it. Forget about the multiplicity of experience, the thousand flat dollars. Oh, wait. Equivalence, that's it. Put it there, you'll get paid, everybody's happy. Reduce complexity. There's something a bit more, and this is where I get back to machine translation you'll see in a minute. It's a remarkable fact, and this is picked up by Derrida in several places, that a piece of language can remain meaningful beyond its context of enunciation. That is, we know that meaning depends on context, we've known this for a long time, but how is it that a piece of language can be picked up 
In the case of Derrida, he's talking about Romeo and Juliet. No, he's talking about The Merchant of Venice, a play which is meaningful in Shakespeare's age, but continues to be meaningful in many other cultures and many other versions. Ha always a bit different. The repetition is never identity, it is iterability for Derrida. How is it that language can remain meaningful beyond its place of enunciation? If it can be, then the repetition is meaningful. The repetition is necessary. It doesn't say exactitude, but that repetition can create identity and the equivalence is the stamp of approval on that identity. I'll come to that in a minute. The last one I want to talk about very briefly is that this whole project was at the origin a search for certainty. Remember that we were talking about indeterminism, uh, the grounding of science, the search for a, a real experience of the object in itself, one plus one equals two, you know, for the basics. The early 20th century was engaged in that sort of thought about certitude at a point when the main sciences, that is physics, but also biology, economics, political economics, demographics, many of the sciences had already turned to probability. They had given up trying to say what is true. They would give a percentage of probability with which this hypothesis could be significant or not. That is, they forgot about truth. They were talking about statistical probability. Nobody in the Western tradition that I've just named looked at mathematics, looked at statistics, looked at probability. They were concerned with pre-categorical experience. Now, why is that of interest to me? I think all those reasons are, are good reasons why equivalence is still around, why we can still talk about it. But what does machine translation do? What are its philosophical foundations. One, it assumes iterability. Machine translation and translation memories are always picking up a bit of language from one situation with a translation, picking it up and saying, hey, use it in another situation. But we know it can't, because language depends on context. They say, I don't care. I'm going to do that. I'm going to look, I'm going to do iterability. I'm going to pick this up here and put it down there, and it's going to work. It can't work because uh, there's always specific context. Ah, it's going to work. Authority or reduced complexity, or all those reasons come in. Okay? But the machine translation in its foundations assumes that iterability. And the second thing, the neural machine translation we have bases its iterability on statistics, of probability on that 19th century solution that was somehow forgotten about and sidelined by the critiques of structuralism and post-structuralism, the two movements I've just described to you. Because of iterability and because of probability, there are firm foundations now for the return of equivalence. That man is Hans-Georg Gadamer, giving a lecture at the age of 90. And he's talking about the Tower of Babel. And he's talking about the way science helps humanity construct its modernist versions of the Tower of Babel. At one point, though, he laments that the basis of the sciences that now build our Tower of Babel going up to heaven is mathematics, dehumanized calculations of numbers. He was an old man at the age of 90. And he calls for a rehumanization of communication. He calls for a, a, a fresh engagement with the multiplicity of languages beyond mathematics, beyond iterability in the actual encounter of person-to-person -person communication. Gadamer, at the age of 90, is, was, a voice in the wilderness. 
A machine translation has returned equivalence to us because it corresponds to the most powerful philosophical and scientific ideas of our age. Thank you very much. Questions? Colleagues? Yes, please. Uh, about one and a half years ago, uh, Professor Yves Gambier uh, actually gave a lecture uh, at this university and mentioned that the development of uh, printing technology actually contributed to the, uh, the notion of the equi equivalence uh, because transcription is not always reliable. But now we are in a um, uh, digital area and uh, you know, um, e-books have become very popular. Uh, and actually, these digital texts are uh, made up of uh, binary codes. Uh, binary codes can be transformed into uh, words and pictures. So they are subject to change. Uh, so in, in this situation, to what extent uh, that the, the notion of uh, equivalence is still workable for the, this uh, fluid text? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I would, I think I've actually written on that. I, I, I would agree with Yves Gombe, and I've said myself, that equivalence is the mode of thought best suited to print culture. Prior to print culture, when you have a manuscript tradition, with text being written, there are constant changes and constant changes to, to dialect and, and, and changes in, in, in language variety. So the text, the ST, the star text, is, is itself in movement, and there's nothing firm to be equivalent to. Okay? Once print culture comes in, you have a printed text, which is repetition of the same, like that, like that. Sorry, microphone. Love that microphone. Okay. The machine, like Gutenberg's machine, enables that sort of repetition, uh, which firms up the category, and you can be equivalent to something. That's true. But the word equivalence didn't appear until the 20th century, apart from you know, literature in the 19th century. Uh, there was, I think, a notion of fidelity, which was based on it, but was always subject to fidelity to a text, fidelity to a person. Uh, so it wasn't as clearly fixed as it is in the 20th century as, as a linguistic ideology. Now, the interest to me of that is that when we move into electronic communication, we remove, we return to the fluidity of the star text. I don't think the fact that there are binary codes in the computer is really affecting anything much. It's the speed with which we can update a computer program or update a website and change these texts very quickly, which means that in theory, uh, the ST, the source text, has become transformational and movable. So it's not surprising that there are so many critiques of equivalence in the age of electronic communication. That, and I, I wrote that, and Eve didn't copy me, and I didn't copy him. We agree on that. <laughs> but I see something different happening here, because I see that the claims being made for neural machine translation are purely based on equivalence. We had it yesterday, you know, reflects the semantic content. Hey. Uh, um, so the, it hasn't disappeared at all. And it still remains very strong in the practice of translation. Uh, so I think we can... We were too soon, we were too quick to pronounce the end of the world. Yeah? I think equivalence is still operative there, in our very professional level. Coming to going, in our dealings with our clients.